everyone, and welcome to the Desktop Developer Show, a weekly conversation with people who inhabit the smart client world. Where pioneers that bend our perception through amazing graphics displays. This is a live stream. We encourage your participation. Tell us what types of projects you are working on or ask questions in the chat window. If you're watching after the live stream is over, we encourage you to join us live next time. We do this every on LinkedIn every Thursday. I'm joined this week by my co-host, Billy Hollis. How are you today, Billy? Doing good, Walt. I'm, I'm, it's sunny and beautiful in Tennessee, and I have to admit that I can't wait to finish this off and get out and do some yard work and enjoy the, the outside air for a bit. That sounds wonderful. Uh, do you, did you bring a tip for us this week? Yeah, I did. I, I have wrote something way back at the beginning of the WPF era that, that, that kind of helped do something that, that I had been able to kind of kludge in Windows Forms around the ability to do gadgets on a desktop. And so I want to show that, show the, 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 some of the couple of the techniques behind it, because that's, again, one of the sort of thing that some of these native technologies make easy and is hard in some of the more generic technologies. That sounds nice. We're going to do that tip at the end of the show. So if you're watching live, be sure and stick around for that tip. And now we have Renee in the live uh, stream too. Hello, Renee. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you again, Billy and Walt. It's been oh, a while. It's been a while. Yes. Uh, you're still, uh, I see you're still spending a lot of time in the graphic side of the development house. Yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you really is I think the three of us on this uh, live stream of we spend a lot of our time thinking about how to build either user interfaces or, you know, Interesting graphic displays. For how? Why did why did you choose this path? What what in, intrigues you about changing the graphics that are shown on the screen? Yeah, so I studied media and computer science basically back in the days. So it's been a while now, and, and uh, you know I always got inspired by uh, you know moving pixels basically, but in the end you know for me it's like being more of a developer and not a designer. Um, I love that I can write code that moves pixels in 2D or in 3D. And it's so rewarding, right? When you, for example, I wrote a little engine a while back with DirectX 8 or 9. It's been a while again. And this was super cool because, like, you know, you spend so much time to, you know, actually getting everything set up, initialized. And once you have the first triangle later on a cube rendering on the screen and rotating, it's so rewarding, right? Because it's visual. And that, that helps me. I'm a visual person, so I guess that's why. I don't know. But yeah, I always love computer graphics and 3D that's computer same, graphics even more. Same here. I remember uh, when I was able to move a pixel around on the screen in my early, early days of programming. To me, that was the most, I mean, I like programming in general, uh, yeah. but the ability to make that red pixel move around in a circle and figuring out how to, how to do that animated. Uh, was just super fascinating. So I've always liked spending my time there. Now, did you get involved? Um, I know you were you did some stuff with Silverlight. Was that your first foray into the graphics world? Uh, not really. It was way before Win32 and then uh, in DirectX and whatnot. But you know, once Silverlight came out, it was pretty fascinating because I also did WPF, right? And since we're all friends here, we have been working together for a while. And uh, you know, back in the Silverlight days, um, when I became an MVP, I became an MVP when there was Silverlight, basically. Because what I was doing at this time was, uh, you know, exploring how I can uh, write shaders, basically. You know, 3D sh um, like uh, graphics shaders, pixel shaders, for a Silverlight, and that was pretty cool because you can write pixel shader code that just runs in your browser. And that was back in the days with Silverlight. And I know, Walt, I use your tool a lot, which you wrote back then, which is Shazam. Have you ever heard was... the story about Shazam? No, tell us. So um, Microsoft included shaders in, um, I don't re do you remember, Billy, I forget, was it in the initial version of WPF? Oh, yeah, there was, well. I think it came so in the second version. Versions, yeah. There was a, there was kind of a primitive thing, and then there was a more sophisticated version later. Right, and so I was teaching a class for Wittelect at the time, and I was doing a WPF class, and I, uh, 
I went back to the hotel room at night and WPF, the new version was coming out. I think, I can't remember if it had come out yet or it was coming out. And I thought, well, I want to talk about, it was like the last day of the class. And I thought, well, maybe I'll talk about some of the new features that are in WPF and shaders is one. And so I wrote a little demo in the hotel room that night about how to, how to show a shader on the screen, uh, a custom shader, because I think it's shipped with two shaders and you've got two shaders, blur and drop shadow. Okay, and, yeah. Right. And then you can write your own. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I finally have an easy way to write a shader without having to understand all the shader pipeline and other stuff that never made any sense to me. And so it went over really well in the class. So when I flew home the next day on the flight home, I said, well, how could I make this customizable? You know, rather than how can I make it so that I can edit the, the shader live? and see the results and that's what became shazam um and and then uh, it, they added it to silverlight too right and that's when you came and started working with it yeah and you know i, I use your tool a lot to write a, a bunch of cool shaders for silverlight that i then published on my blog this was amazing paul with with silverlight right you can get you know wpf technology in the end uh, with xaml and all the other goodies um running in your browser and you know i could just write shaders and publish them on the, in the blog post and you know back in the days with Silverlight, it was a uh, rather limited uh the instruction set you could write for shader so yes. it was also this this kind of challenge right and i always love these kind of challenge when you're working in these kind of certain constraints right you need to stay in these boundaries of i don't recall how many instructions but they definitely i spent a lot of time for more complex shaders to tweak them change instructions reduce them optimize and uh, that was, you know, it's fun because it's a challenge. And uh, if you're passionate about that technology, I guess you you enjoy doing that. I know it's weird, but that's that's why we're geeks, right? Yes. <laughs> well, it, I, I have a question for both of you kind of concerning that. And that is, I, I used some of those to solve some interesting problems back then. And, and then I used a lot of the composition even more, some of the layering and stuff that you could do with uh, both WPF and Silverlight. And I didn't see as much traction among routine developers as I thought the technology warranted. Yeah. Um, so, Renee, particularly, is the, does the 3D stuff seem to get more traction with developers? Does it light them up more? And what do we do in order to help people understand that some of this technology can actually solve some pretty interesting business problems? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um so maybe maybe making the connection from Silverlight to maybe the modern area of, uh, of uh, you know Windows development on many devices. Um, so I also started an open source project back then, which is which was a port of the AR toolkit, and I called it Slaw Toolkit for Silverlight basically. And the AR toolkit, you had to use these black rectangles with a certain code inside, and so this is called marker-based tracking, right? And then on the marker, you have a reference position, and you can show some three D content. And that was was pretty cool. And then, you know, that is of course ten years or more later now. But we have that in so many devices, right? We have um, AR technology in mobile devices like this here, or your iPhone, or we have devices like the the Hololens, right? Uh, this is a Hololens two here, and this is a dedicated. Well, it's called a mixed reality device from Microsoft, as you probably heard. But I like to use the the terminology spatial computing, which includes. You know, VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, which is the whole spectrum between VR and AR and all of that. Uh, but spatial computing is a nicer term for me because it also includes devices like a mobile phone that can already spatially sense the world around us. And also devices like a Kinect, like an Azure Kinect, for example, like right? a 3D sensing camera. And also when we talk about spatial computing, the nice thing is, Think about when, you know, in the 90s or yeah, maybe the 90s, end of 80s, 90s, personal computing took off, right? Personal computers became a thing. Then in the 2000s, even more with the internet. And then the, the last decade was all about mobile computing, right? With mobile phones. And a lot of the kids don't even have a computer anymore. They just have a mobile phone. And so we have mobile computing. And the next wave is spatial computing, basically, where we have devices that can spatially sense the environment around them. And to answer your question, we see a lot of uptake for that in interest with a lot of business clients as well. So it's not just for fun and gaming and all of that. I mean, you can solve definitely real, real business challenges with devices like this. If you think about manufacturing scenarios or um, other 
scenario. It's it's so wide, right? There's no given vertical. It's it's just basically any vertical where you can add a lot of value by blending in 3D content, augmenting the real world, but right in your eyes, basically, right? You have these semi-transparent displays. You might see them a little bit shimmering here. And you know they allow you to blend in virtual content on top of the real world you're seeing. And that is, of course, very interesting because when you wear that on your on your head uh, with this head-mounted device, you have your hands free, right? So you're not you're not uh, you know holding a tablet in your hand. You're not using a computer, or a mouse, or something like that. You're basically wearing a computer on your head, which runs Windows 10. That has all the processing. That's a battery. Has all the processing built in. Bunch of sensors to spatially sense your surrounding, and therefore allowing you to augment your real world with context relevant information. And you could think about like showing re repair instructions right at the real object. Right, instead of having to look at a tablet or whatever and need to scroll through pages of instructions, you see the content blended in the real world with the real context, and you have your hands free for real world tools. And yeah, we see a lot of value with our clients there. And you, so you, there's two things I like to uh, uh, focus on in what you said. One is you mentioned the Azure Connect. Now, how does yeah. that fit into the picture? Well, we're using the Azure Connect for a couple of things. Um, so maybe for, you know, they were all on the same page. I know you you know what it is, but basically the Azure Connect is called a depth camera or a 3D sensing camera. And it does not have just an, an RGB, a color sensor, but it has another sensor called a depth sensor that basically measures the distance to objects, right? How far is, is that object away? How far is that away? And so on. And therefore you get the, uh, record, we get 3D information of the environment. And you can use that for a lot of scenarios. For example, the, the Connect also supports body tracking. So it can figure out, okay, this is at my head, uh, this is a hand, and here you have an elbow joint and so on, right? So it can track that. And for example, you know, use cases could be if you mounted camera somewhere um, these days, you know, in the COVID time and age, uh, social distancing is important, right? People need to stay at a certain distance. You could use such a camera that tracks bodies basically for, you know, measuring that in a, in a workplace, for example, very easily. And um, things like that. Or we're using it for a, a piece called Holobeam, which is our holographic live streaming solution. So basically what we do there is we take the data from a 3D camera like the Kinect, and then we develop an algorithm where we can package the data up so that we can stream it over a normal internet connection, which just takes 5 to 10 Mbit for full HD. And that means we just use a normal internet connection. Other solutions, they use 50 or 100 Mbit. So if, what we created is that we can encode the RGB plus depth data in such a way it fits over normal internet connection with adaptive streaming. And then on the viewing side, you put on a HoloLens, or it could be another device where you can see 3D, and then you see the other person, basically, that is in front of the, you know, that's maybe like, well, if you would be in front of such an Azure Connect, I could see you with my HoloLens, not just as a 2D video, but as a 3D video, as a 3D volumetric video, and that via normal internet streaming. And that's what we use the, uh, such kind of 3D cameras for. So when you say we, you're talking about your company? Yeah, Valorum Reply. Yeah, I, I'm so I work as a director of global innovation at Valorum Reply and, um, you know, working on such kind of innovative technologies and pieces. Um, but yeah, that's um, what we do. And uh, so they had a question. You mentioned uh, there's several things. One, uh, I'd like to figure out how on the whole modeling, I think Billy has some questions about 3D modeling. But before we get to that, the, in the HoloLens, you have to, you said your hands are free. And right. so you spent uh, you spent some time with WPF and you spent some time with Silverlight and there we use a XAML based framework and mm -hmm. we are building your traditional flat screen UIs. Right. Right. When you put on a, a headset of any type, uh, how, how does that change the way you think about building a user interface? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, it's a whole different world. Um, Cause you basically, I mean, I'm not a designer, but of course, you know, I can, I'm a very visual person and we also have designers on the team. And so, you know, you need to, some things you need to unlearn basically. Um, Cause you wanna have, you can have a, you know, a 3D app where you have 2D buttons in it. You can do that, right? The UI would show up. You would have like a, like think about like a floating panel here and then you can touch it. But that would be a 2D UI. And if you're wearing a device that can sense the world around you plus, 
it can render stereo 3D where you can really see the depth of um, you know, content, basically. You really want to have a 3D UI as well. And not just a 3D UI, where you have like a button that has a certain uh, kind of uh, a, a, you know touch feeling, if you will, right? Because you don't have the real touch, but you have the holographic touch. So if you touch the button, you want to have a little bounce, a little physics, physical-based effect, like a little spring, for example. If you touch it, it moves back and it reacts more. So it's much more complicated than just having a 2D button where you're highlighting it and so on. You need to add the depth to it, definitely. And the second thing is with spatial computing devices, like I said, they sense the world around you. So you want to make that UI and you want to make these controls part of the real world, right? And so maybe skeuomorphic design makes more sense in the 3D world. But then again, you know, from the visual standpoint, it co of course, it can be a whole different design. Uh, but definitely you want to have something that integrates in the context of what you're seeing right in front of your eyes. I, I, I certainly can back up the idea that the flat screen 2D stuff, doing that, we went into some clients and said, okay, you could put all these status panels above your your manufacturing lines and you could right. see all kinds of interesting things. Uh, but everybody agreed it was cool and, and nobody really cared enough to put any money into it. It just it didn't light them up. So I agree that finding finding things about the 3D environment that enhance the experience that you just can't get by right. carrying around a tablet or something is, is, is kind of key to it. And some of those things that I tried back at the beginning of the uh, spatial computing era, because I, I have a couple of HoloLens ones, the original version, is I wanted to go, all right, suppose I'm in a warehouse and I want to, I don't know, guys on forklift or something. I want to be able to paint on the floor a big arrow for where he needs to go with the load. Right. Got right there we now. go. And, and that was really, really hard to do because I didn't, I didn't have a good frame of reference for where everything was. And I understand that, yeah, you've worked with some of the spatial anchoring stuff that, that we have now, and that apparently solves some of those problems. Yeah, that's an exciting technology uh, with the spatial anchors. Um, but by the way, yeah, since you mentioned you have the original HoloLens, uh, just yesterday, um, Alex Kipman, the, uh, the basically the head behind the HoloLens, uh, announced that the HoloLens is five years old. Yeah, so it's, that's it's already it's already five years. Uh, can you imagine? It's crazy. I mean, the public announcement and all of that, right? Of course, they have been working on it much longer. But wow, that's that's crazy, isn't it? Um, the actual spatial anchors is a very interesting technology. So you might wonder, what is that? Basically, like I mentioned, these devices can spatially sense the world around us. And what we want to do is we want to persist virtual content in the context of the physical world, right? Which means um, I can use an, an augmented reality and AR application on this phone. I can, you know, sh show some content here, or I can put on a HoloLens, show some content here somewhere, whatever. Uh, but if I if I come back the next day, you know, I need to relocate. I want to see the same content at the exact same position. And this is what spatial anchors solve. And basically what they do is they create a digital copy, a digital twin of our physical world. And so this device, or even mobile phones, like I said, they can spatially sense the world. And so they can get the information about the real world and then use that to bring in virtual content to augment virtual content on top of the real, but you know, persist it. So you can come back at a later time, next day, next week, whatever, uh, relocalize, you know, find the position you're in basically using this digital copy of the physical world. And then it will figure out, okay, someone left some virtual content here, someone dropped an anchor, a spatial anchor there, and then it can relocalize that anchor and you can show the exact same content at the exact same location. And that's so, using- uh, Can I ask a question there? So you're yeah. saying that the device, in this case, it's your phone. You're holding right. up your phone. Your phone does this, can do yes. the mapping. So if I walk into a room with my device and it maps it, mm -hmm. uh, then, and I leave and it comes back, does it remember the mapping or does it remap it every time you come back into the room? Right. Um, so it basically remaps a certain part of it. And then it can figure out, OK, I, it matches the pattern to what it has seen previously. And so then it can find the whole picture, basically. right? If you just show it a certain area, it will find, oh, yeah, that's this room. And I've mapped out much more before. And then it can you know, find itself again. It's called relocalization, basically. And the, the, and cool then the, part, spa the yeah? spatial anchor part, then, is something that you, as a programmer, add to that map. Is that what you're saying? 
Right. And so basically you can then set a spatial anchor in that location. And then you can use that technology like Azure Spatial Anchors to relocalize it. And the cool part is with Spatial Anchors all around for a little while on uh, HoloLens or Magic Leap up somewhere here is a backpack Magic Leap. Magic Leap or um, that's an Android phone or iPhone. They all have this concept of a Spatial Anchor, World Anchor, uh, Persisted Coordinate Frame. They all have that different names. But I say it's the same thing. But the thing is, it just lives on that device. It lives on this device or lives on this device, right? But not together. And the cool part is with Azure Spatial Anchors, you can upload these anchors in the Azure Cloud and um, you can work cross-platform between different devices. So you can use a HoloLens 2 or 1, Android with AR Core or, or uh, iOS with AR Kit. And they all support the concept of an anchor. And so they can all use the Azure Spatial Anchor Service, which means I can get persistence because it stores it in the cloud and I can switch devices. And so I get persistence plus cross-platform shared experiences between different devices that have the same reference location, the same reference position and orientation. So it's not just the position, it's also the orientation of that anchor that is being maintained. And that's pretty amazing because um, that's a lot of data. Um, the good thing though is with ASA, Azure Spatial Anchors, they don't upload any camera frames to the cloud, which is very important from a privacy standpoint. Um, you can, because you know, it, it's all based on computer vision. I have not mentioned it, but basically, it's running computer vision under the hood, called SLAM. It's an algorithm called simultaneous localization and mapping. So it runs these groups of algorithms basically to figure out to do the computer vision. So it's not using GPS or any kind of Wi-Fi thing or printing or, or beacons or things like that. It's using computer vision. It analyzes camera frames basically. And that gives you a centimeter range precision. So we're talking about five to 10 centimeters. It really depends on, on the floor and the patterns and so on, right? If I have a wide wall, which I don't have, but if I would have a white wall, it's of course not very good for computer vision because that is not a lot of contrast. This guy, Baby Yoda, wearing a whole lens is great because it has a lot of you know information, a lot of stuff it can track. Um, but like I, like what I wanted to say about privacy, so a lot of camera frames are being analyzed to figure out uh, you know the in information, so-called feature points are being extracted. Um, but no camera frame is leaving your device, so they do all the processing on the device and then to the cloud, to the Azure Spatial Anchor Service only the set of feature points is being uploaded, which is basically you think about these are the relevant points of that certain area. You know, this is basically the the um, um, identif identif identifier for that uh, kind the of fingerprint location. fingerprint for that area. The so fingerprint, that was the world I was looking for, exactly. It's the fingerprint, and that is being uploaded to the Azure Spatial Anchor Service. And even then, um, in ASA, they actually store a hash, a so-called spatial hash where you can basically compute the distance between uh, another set of feature points. You compute another spatial hash, and then you can compute the distance. How far are they away? How, what is the probability that the person is in the same space? Ah, that's an interesting way to do the metric. Uh, I mean, you mentioned something about some of the privacy stuff, because there are all kinds of things we could do right. in, with, with virtual reality interfaces i i one of the first things i thought of when i put on the hololens back five years ago was wouldn't it be nice if because i'm getting old now so i forget people's names and of course there are always people i don't know um yeah. it wouldn't it be nice if there was just a bubble over people telling me who they are while yeah. I was on the HoloLens. but theoretically that sounds good but i don't see how we're ever, we're going to get that in the foreseeable future because of privacy concerns that's that's one thing, and also the form factor, of course, right? I mean, you you don't want to wear that device and you know walk around all the time, and you know it's still it's great for professional use cases, enterprise use cases. There's a ton of stuff, but this is not a consumer device, right? Yeah. Like not yet, and you know I'm still optimistic. Um, in the 2020s, we will see smaller, lightweight devices, uh, with the right form factors that will make them appear and the, as a consumer device, right? I want to have it integrated in this kind of glasses or even yeah, smaller, yeah. That would right? be nice to have your regular glasses have the, uh, right. didn't we had Google tried that, right? Yeah, but Google Google had one thing. It was just very small. It was not a head-mounted device. It was a heads-up display. You had a very small, tiny display right here sitting and it looked like a Borg or something, right? So it was not just from, from a design standpoint, I think it wasn't optimal. And also the whole story they had around it was just not 
Yeah, but the Google Glass has a, has a, a renaissance, if you will, um, in the industry. It's, it's being used quite a bit. Um, Google Glass for enterprise has, well, it's, it's doing okay, I think. And uh, you know, for professional use cases, think about where uh, you know storage, warehouse workers, and things like that, where you really just need a little heads-up display with certain information. It cannot sense the environment much, but it can, uh, you know, show you a certain information. Um, also, if you're reading a QR code, you can see it right here, and and all of that stuff. What's the um, next but, item I need to pick up out in the warehouse? That let's show me, just show me that list, so that I don't have to finger up right. up, up, up some kind of touch device to do it. Yeah, right. And and you know, talking about COVID and the whole stuff um, about you know hygienics things and whatnot, you don't need to touch stuff right yeah you, you see point. it right that's another like benefit of it or well, think about you have uh you go to um let's say uh i don't know grocery store and you want to you, you want to know about the nutrition data right you need to grab the package turn it around look at it and do things with it i think about you would have such a device that can recognize with ai with object yeah. recognition what product it is and just show you a little overlay you don't need to touch it and so Maybe there's a you know there are some opportunities in, in that space as well. Um, yeah, I, I've did some research with the Hololens and running um, object recognition models on it, which is pretty cool. So what I did is I I pre-trained a neural network using um, custom vision AI. So basically, you upload a bunch of photos from a certain object, give it a label, and then uh, you can train a neural network, an AI model. And then you can export that actually. So you can run, you can still have it in the cloud and use a REST API to talk with it. But you can also uh, export that as an Onyx model, ONNX. And that runs using uh, Windows machine learning or Windows mm. AI technology. Uh, it can run locally on your machine. And that works on your desktop, on your Windows desktop. And, you know, HoloLens, again, it's, it, of course, it's, uh, it doesn't look like a desktop PC, but it's a Windows 10 device. So it can run WinML. Which means I took that pre-trained model and run it here right on the Hololens with the Hololens one back then. I have it now running on the Hololens two, and I get almost real-time re results back. And so when you, I, when you mentioned a model, are you talking a three D model? No, I, I mean an AI model, like a okay. deep, deep learning yeah. model, where you train uh, a three D. Uh, sorry, not a three D. Where you train uh, certain images, certain objects, and you train right. a neural network, and then you have it pre-trained to later on recognize the exact same objects again, even they, even if they look a little bit different, right? That's the power of these AI models is that they can interpolate between differences a little bit, and they're not like, um, you know, hundred percent. It needs to be look like that. It can be a little bit flexible, if you will. Um, yeah, but. You know, and then you can show a 3D model on top of it, of course, once you recognize it. And that's the amazing part with, with that kind of device, um, you know, seeing 3D content holograms blended into your real right. world view is just an amazing experience. I remember when I tried the first one probably five years ago, I don't recall, but it was just mind blowing, right? It was one of these, I've been doing VR in the university. We had these, what is called a, a power wall. It's basically a reflective surface. It's a um, silver coated surface where you have special projectors that you project on it. And then you wear these stereo glasses, right? Um, and then you can see 3D content and virtual reality and or these these caves, or as they called, six-sided or five-sided caves for virtual reality. That's what we had in university. And then you had the Oculus coming out and you had you know all these new VR devices of the new wave of VR, if you will. And then we had the HoloLens, and then the first time I could see this 3D content on top of the real world with my own eyes blended in stereo 3D, it was just an amazing moment. And uh, yeah, you know, and that's that I since then it's just uptaking. I vividly remember putting on a HoloLens for the first time because look, I'm old and cynical about technology, smaller, faster, whatever, cheaper kind of stuff. I've seen so many ways of that that it just doesn't make any impact on me anymore. And right. and the HoloLens was the first thing in at least 10 years that really grabbed me. And the first thing is the mathematician in me and the psychologist and understanding how the vision system works and things like that. I, I, I saw the still frames and, and, and I said, it's going to jitter. I'm going to put this on and it's going to jitter. And it didn't. And I was just shocked by that. So yeah, it was right. an amazing experience. Now I have one use case that I kind of imagined from the beginning. I'd like to see if you have any, uh, if you've seen anybody trying to do this, because I can imagine as a developer, and I think our audience would probably like to think about this, 
that, that we haven't really made dramatic advances in our tools in a long time. I mean, right. Visual Studio is based on Visual Basic from 1991. So I imagined object graphs in 3D and having as many screens around as I needed to show the different things that I needed to. Right. Is anybody making any, any efforts in that area that you know of? Uh, well, you know, basically there are two major 3D engines that are being used in the industry here. Um, it's Unity, Unity 3D, the, the game engine, the game tooling, if you will. But it's not just used for games. It's really also in the enterprise field and you can build 3D applications with it. And the other uh, famous engine is Unreal from Epic Games. And, uh, you know, these are basically the, the two. We have a few more, of course. But these are the big players, basically, that are being used for, uh, you know, basically developing these kind of applications. Because Visual Studio is not really providing you the tools. Because, like you're saying, you want to see like the 3D world a little bit before, you know, when you design your application, when you design your, your thing. And so these 3D engines, they have nice editors where you have, you know, a 3D world, basically a 3D screen. You see all the content in 3D, and you can rotate around and uh, you know immerse yourself a little bit into this 3d world and that's what you really need is um you cannot you know writing mock-up language in 2d is can already be a challenge but now think about the third dimension on top of it that's that's, that's crazy that's so you want to have a visual editor basically that i want the environment itself like whatever the next generation of visual studio is that that instead of an object browser i've got this 3D thing that it takes my APIs that I created and all the relationships and allows me to see them in 3D and spin them around and zero in on the one I want and things like right. that as a developer, not as, right. as as creating assets for other people, but stuff right. actually for me. Right. Uh, you want to have a scene graph, basically. That's what all these yeah. tools have. They have right. a, a 3D scene graph, basically, right. in the end. And so you, you want to have that in, in XAML, maybe, or whatever mockup language you're using. Whatever um, API, yeah, any API. Right. You know, right. you keep mentioning you keep mentioning 3D models, and one of the things I notice when I've done programming in this space is that uh, it's really hard to create the model. Yeah. Or you have to buy a model, and a lot of times the models that you can buy from the store are nothing like what you really want. Uh, so how do you? I heard there's some more realistic ways of of getting models into right. your applications. Right. Like you're saying, there the content creation is always a challenge. Um, so there are multiple ways how you can get to a 3D model, but typically, um, you know, it involves a 3D artist or an engineer that creates a 3D model. And what some people do is basically you take, um, or what a lot of our clients provide us, uh, they provide us CAD models, CAD, computer aided design 3D models, because you know they design every product these days or every new piece or building, it's all designed in 3D, right? And that's typically done with CAD programs. And then you can export a 3D representation out of that, which you can then deploy on a HoloLens or another device. But that's a very involved process because uh, you need to reduce the complexity because these CAD models are typically way too complex, hundreds, millions of polygons, super high detailed. And then we're talking about mobile devices like this that cannot render it on a device itself. And so there is a new tech uh, actually being used with, uh, which is called Azure Remote Rendering, where you can render these kind of super complex model, not locally on the device, but in the cloud. So basically you, the input from the whole lens, like the head rotation and the movement and all of that is being sent to um, also the hand input, right? Because this device, I have not mentioned it, but you probably know it can also recognize hands. So it can, you know, see your hands and you can interact with the real, uh, with the, the virtual objects, just like you would do with a real world object. You're just missing the haptic feedback a little bit. Anyway, so all the input is sent from your HoloLens to these Azure Remote Rendering um, GPU VMs, virtual machines, that then render your complex 3D model and stream back a video for the left and the right eye into the HoloLens which then can show that to you. And I was blown away. Uh, the service is quite new. It's in public preview now. I was blown away how good it works because I was expecting, similar like Billy back then with the Hollands one, I was also expecting that it's not tracking. It's very jittery, but it's not. They nailed the tracking with the Hollands one already, Hollands two even better, and it's super stable. These objects stay in the real world relation as when you position them. And so back to the Azure Remote Rendering part here, I was skeptical if, I will have latency. You know, I was expecting latency and delay because, again, sending input to a VM in the cloud, it's rendered there and sends the frames, the render frames back. Of course, there's latency. 
But they do some really clever tricks with hardware features the HoloLens has called late state reprojection. Then they're using post estimation and so on to then, you know, basically predict where the user will be looking. And then once the frame is back at the device, they do late state reprojection to map it into the space. Anyway, uh, long story short, Azure Remote Rendering basically allows you to render these super complex models as they are with Azure Remote Rendering in the cloud and then view them on the HoloLens. And that's an amazing feature. So you can take these existing CAD models. Another, another thing is you might wonder, hmm, what if I don't have a 3D model available, if I don't have a CAT model available from a product? Yeah, that was one of my questions. Like, how do right. you, can you scan your own into right. the... Exactly. And that's, that's, that's a lot of uptake. And that's also why I love the spatial computing terminology, because it also includes the 3D scanning, if you will. Because we have mobile devices. And I can show you this one. I, I, that's a, a newer Samsung S20+, Plus, which has a, a time of flight camera here. So it, it has a similar camera uh, system like, a, like an Azure Connect or HoloLens also has a depth sensor, but not as sophisticated, of course, right? But still quite good. And I can use that to create 3D models. Like, look at this. This is a, like an Easter Bunny a 3D scan. That's a real wooden Easter Bunny. You can see it's a, it's a lock kind of. Um, and, you know, painted. My, my uncle makes those. Uh, anyway, so I did a 3D scan just with this mobile phone. And you see the details. It's, it's quite impressive. Does and, it take a long time to scan that model? No. No, it, you just basically, you, you know, you have the real world objects. You just walk around it like once. You basically rotate around it, and that's it. Or you can put it on a, on a podium and rotate the podium, whatever. And that's amazing, right? So, you know, if you have a depth sensor, even better. But the awesome part is you don't, even, amazing. You, you, you don't even need a depth sensor. You can just use an iPhone or an Android device these days. And an app for there's an app in the store called Display Lens which allows you to create 3D scans just with a normal RGB camera on your mobile phone. Wow. And that's impressive. And so you can quickly create these digital twins of real objects. And then you know you have your content creation problem almost solved because uh, you also have a way to render these super complex models. Right? That's fascinating to me because as I was saying it when I started this thread is like, so you can't, as a developer, there's nobody making that you can't buy a model of what you want like that easter bunny there's nobody that sells that model of that exact thing and as a programmer i don't know how to uh make that 3d model right exactly or maybe i do but it's it's a it's a fine art and i had to pay somebody else to, in the past we had to pay somebody else to scan that but you're saying right. i if i buy the right phone uh, or any device that has the right camera right. in it that i can scan it myself yep and and uh you know, the, the new iPad Pro, for example, also has a depth sensor on it. Uh, they call it a LiDAR sensor, but it, basically it's also a time of flight uh, sensor. Same thing, uh, like like I showed you on my phone. Well, of course, a different vendor and all of that of the sensor itself. But yeah, you see more and more devices with depth sensors um, being uh, available. And um, that will just continue in the future. You know, and even though you don't have, and even for devices where you don't have a depth sensor, uh, you can still use algorithms to get a 3D reconstruction. And uh, that's also part of this whole AR cloud, the augmented reality cloud, which Azure Spatial Anchors is basically one implementation of that, that we we have devices that can spatially sense the world. Now we also need the cloud servers basically to maintain a digital copy of the world so that we can have persisted content all over the place, which we can view with these devices in a, in a spatial context, right? And again, you know, coming back to the spatial computing, all of that is coming together in the next couple of years. Also, with more lightweight devices, we will see there's a couple of um, you know vendors and startups that are working on very lightweight devices that almost looks like um, you know sunglasses or a little bit bigger, but not that much. Really small, lightweight form factors. Nice. And, and things like Azure Remote Rendering and that you know, rendering of remote content or remotely rendering content becomes even more important, right? If you have smaller form factors with less computing power. So all of these things are coming together. It's a fascinating time to be working in the graphic space. I mean, it's just, like you said, Call Lens is only five years old. Right. And look at how much, how far we've come in just the last five years. Um, Brett can't wait to see what else you're doing. Billy, do you have any other questions for Renee before we go to your tip? No, I think I got the major ones in and, and, and boy, this, and I have to admit, from my own perspective, while I did a lot of work when the HoloLens first came out, bought two HoloLenses, and then when it wasn't a specialty virus, so I confess that that I'm not as up on that. And this has been uh, this has been a really fascinating overview of some of the stuff I did not realize at all that you could 
do the scanning and get your 3D assets uh, because that's one of the big constraints. So no, I've, I don't have any more questions. I'm kind of blown away by what I've seen. Yeah. So you're going to show uh, Master Chief. Is he a 3D model? Yeah. Yeah. You know, trying to sort of we're back to the 3D world, so to speak. Uh, nice. I think we I forgot can, to share your screen before we started. Yeah, let's, uh, let's see if we can't get my screen shared. Is that possible at this point? Let's see if I can scare. Yeah, we should have, we're supposed to do that before the show starts. There yeah. you go. Okay, right. I'm going to add it to the screen. There we go. Adding to the stream. So you see, Master Chief, though, this is actually one of the most popular programs I ever wrote. So let me show how it works. You can see from the from the solution over there that it's really not very complex at all. Um, I'll start it and kind of show how it works. Let's get rid of the, the window here. Uh, there's Master Chief. And basically, I can move Master Chief anywhere. And I can size him, you see. So if I want to have nice. him sitting, so you can put him kind of in any scene that you'd like to have him at whatever size for you'd like him to be. I was inspired to do that. If you remember in Windows 7, there was this theme uh, of, of landscapes. There was a lush jungle landscape and there was a Western desert landscape. So I, I originally created Master Chief to be able to go into any of those, uh, any of those scenes. And it's, as I said, it's very simple and straightforward. It also taught me a real lesson creating this program. Uh, when, now, if, if you want to see some of the things that make it work, I've actually got a, um, another thing with just a, a simple little arrow that, that kind of shows some of the techniques. So I'll start that and just kind of show you. I can drag the arrow around. That's fine. And then I can double click and get rid of it. Um, the thing that, that, that I learned was that, see, I've done Windows Forms a lot. And I thought, if I'm going to drag it around, I'm going to have to trap mouse events and calculate where it goes. And I could not get that smooth. And then I found out that, in fact, there's only one line of code you need to make that work. You just basically trap when the mouse goes down. And, and see, our platforms get better with every iteration. Let's make that a little bit bigger so you can actually see it better. That one operation already built into the platform took care of it for me. That is literally all there is to make the thing be dragged around. So that taught me the lesson because I wasted probably three hours trying to make this stuff work with doing my own mouse events. Uh, as you move into these very, very rich native platforms, one of the lessons for a developer is um, don't assume you have to do a lot manually. Don't assume you have to do the hard work you did in some of the older platforms. Do your research. Find the things that make to, that make it really easy to do things. And in fact, this uh this blue arrow thing that I've been kind of tinkering around with is the successor to to the desktop master chief that I'm putting in place because I used to have a Windows Forms version of it actually, and this is going to be better. Uh, so if you imagine some of the demos that you might do, that you bring up Visual Studio and you want to point to a particular uh, place on the screen. You want to say, yes, I'm talking about the code. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, my, my, my arrow is too big, but I'm going to make it resizable. You can imagine saying, I want to talk about the code that's right here and sort of give yourself an indicator. So I think those kinds of, of, of widget sort of things have some usefulness. And that's one of the things that's pretty easy to do with a lot of our native technologies. I don't know how you do that in a browser. You know, it's interesting you said is that our tools keep improving and that's something when you work with the tool every day, you kind of gloss over is, but you know, the tools that we work with now are vastly different than what came out in 2002 when we started doing Windows Forms. And I think that we're gonna, uh, Renee, you probably have some thoughts on this, is that we're just getting, starting to see the tooling around mixed reality. And like you said, this modeling thing you showed us just a few minutes ago, I didn't know about that and that, yeah. It, that's a tool that's going to make it so much easier for right. people to do the types of applications you're building. Right. right. Uh, yeah, I, I would say there's a lot of uptake also in that space. Like, you know, how can we improve the tooling? Um, there are tools available, like, you know, similar to the Power App stuff, where you can easily create certain things that are very common. Um, for even for low code or non code environments. And then, of course, you know, you see also a lot of improvement in that whole tooling around AR filters in the end. So if you look at Instagram, Snapchat, and all of that, um, you know, my kids use it, the, the older kids um, they use it a lot. You have these augmented reality face filters, basically. And there's tooling available how to create those. And they built their own tools, basically. They, like Instagram built their own uh, Spark Creator Studio. 
which is you know a custom tool to create augmented reality filters. And they go with that whole effort, and you know the success of it is that they have so many folks, content creators, that create these filters, and they can write also code around it. And you have basically a lot, you know, a big visual display of it, and that's what you need. You need to see it, and um, you need to see all these code changes. And it's coming back full circle to what you did with Shazam, right? It's like, it's really, you can see that real time and that's what you need. You need to see this changes real time being applied. Right, that was the point of that tool, not to go back to old history, but it's like when you're writing a shader and you're writing uh, HLSL in a text editor, that is, I mean, some programmers like doing that, but if you're building a visual anything, you wanna right. be able to see as you tweak it, uh, as you tweak the code, you wanna see the results. And I think we're just at the, at the start of what we're gonna see in the 3D world and the spatial anchoring world. Renee, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Sure. Well, Thanks for uh, having me. A lot of fun, a lot of fun today. Yeah, and join us if you're watching live or watching the recording, join us next week while we'll do some other topic on desktop developing. All right.